what is fascinating about this book is that you, you've taken very extreme examples that actually in their non-extreme form, I think everybody can relate to. But let's talk about why you chose such extremities. In fact, let's deal with this issue. Of, this is a, uh, uh, you take the title of your book, or the, the subtitle, I guess, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity. You could have easily written an entire book, and maybe you still will, that never mentions dwarfism, never mentions, you know, transgender issues, never mentions any of these things. You've gone to the extreme edges of that parent-child relationship. Why and, and what value was there in going that route? So I think a lot of the time the best way to understand the norm is to look at the extreme. So in the same way that if we're looking at construction materials, we test them in super temperatures they'll never encounter on Earth to see ah. if they can really stand up, then we find out what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis with them. And so I felt that by looking at these extremes, I was illuminating all of parenting and all of parents dealing with children who are different and who are searching after identity. Yeah. But I thought these extreme cases illuminated the various sort of sub-issues that there are. So if you're looking at children who are deaf, how do you deal with having a child whose communication system is different from yours? If you're dealing with prodigies, isn't it the case that having a child who has positive qualities that are foreign to you is really just as hard in a lot of ways as a child who has apparently negative qualities? Mm. If you're looking at a question like Down syndrome, how do you balance accepting this child with trying to help this child be the best he can? So each of them posed a set of questions which I think are relevant to everyone, but it, they're in brighter colors if you look at them in those extreme circumstances. Yeah, it makes perfect sense as a methodology. So now let's take... And I, again, we can, you can cherry pick and you can bring up your own uh, samples, but one of the things that in, in the deaf uh, uh, chapter, you talk about this is, I think that there had been this great documentary that came out a number of uh, years ago, too, about these cochlear implants, that they're very controversial in the, in the deaf community because what these implants do is allow people who are deaf to not be deaf. And yet there are a lot of people, that, a, a lot of deaf people who feel like that is a challenge to their own community, that they feel like there is a legitimate deaf culture that these kids are being deprived of. From an outsider, from a non-deaf person, that felt counterintuitive. It felt crazy. And yet there's a strong sense in which that seems to make sense to, to you, to, to the book, and to the reader who eventually goes through this challenge. Can you ex ex sort of explain that kind of counterintuitive notion? So the origin of this book was that about almost 20 years ago, I got an assignment from my editors at the New York Times asking me to write about deaf culture. And I'd never even heard of deaf culture, and I'd mostly mm. been doing foreign reporting. And they said, you've been reporting about these strange and faraway places, and this is a foreign culture right in the middle of our own. And I thought, those poor deaf people, they can't hear, would be great if we could help them. And then I got into the deaf culture. And there is a world, it's organized primarily around the use of sign language, there are deaf clubs, there's deaf theater, there's deaf poetry, there is an incredibly tight community. Mm -hmm. It's not my community, and I don't want to be deaf, and I don't particularly want to join it, but I had to recognize that it seemed to me just as vital and just as vivid as the gay culture I was a part of, or the various minority ethnic cultures that I'd encountered in the mm -hmm. United States, and it was a real shock to me. Now, a lot of people in the deaf community were very upset about the advent of the cochlear implant because it threatened, in effect, to make this culture disappear. Yes. And I feel like there's always a tension between these two things. There's the individual good of allowing a child to have the um, best and richest life that that child can have, and hearing is quite a useful thing to have to function out in the world. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the idea of that deaf culture that I got to know and that I really came to love disappearing from the earth makes me very sad. So how do you reconcile the individual need and the social need? And while the deaf culture is not my culture, I don't want to belong to it. If I had a child, I would get the child a cochlear implant because I would want to be able to communicate fluently with my own child. It would mm -hmm. sadden me not to be able to do that. But at the same time, I recognize that it's just as valid as, for instance, gay culture or Jewish culture or even American culture, any of the cultures that are true to me. And then, again, I, I, there's a part of me that wants to go to every chapter because it's so rich. But let's just deal with the dwarfs. Uh, the issue with them, too, there you talk about this very controversial limb lengthening procedure, which allows, which I guess allows is a word, if you choose to have this, you, you break a kid's legs over and over and over again for a couple of decades so that they actually grow an, an extra 10 inches or 12 inches. And there's controversy there because you are either denying 
what you were, how you were born, or you're accepting and triumphing over how you were born to be better, and that's also very controversial. So I've said to you that I would probably get cochlear implants for my child if my child were deaf. Right. And I would probably not get limb lengthening for my child if my child were a dwarf. Mm. I think it's a somewhat barbaric procedure. It involves years of being in wheelchairs. It's unbelievably painful. It can cause neurological damage. Part of the argument of the book, though, is that, well, that's where I come down. Other people will come down elsewhere, and it's all constantly changing. So now I wouldn't actually try to make my dwarf child taller, but if I'd lived in 1950 in a more conformist America, maybe I would have. Now, is this, you talk about illness versus identity is one of the issues, is that are you defined by, again, an illness I know is a, sounds like a pejorative term, but this idea of whatever makes you exceptional, that becomes who you are, or is that something that you should try to triumph over? Do you come down on either side of the... Do you see it more as an illness, or do you see it more as an identity, or is it the idea that it's a, a fusion of both? My idea is that everything can really be described as an illness or an identity. So there are things that mm. sound like they're obviously illnesses, like deafness, like dwarfism, that people really live as identities. There are also things that sound like identities, like being a genius, that also in many ways function like illnesses. And I said in the end, you can actually experience being... Um, you can experience being American as an illness. You can experience being uh, tall as an illness. You can experience almost any quality you have as an illness. An illness meaning essentially that it's something that impedes your ability to do some things you might like to do. Mm -hmm. Being old, being too young, being all of it has an illness element. And you can also experience as an identity even, I mean, when my mother was dying of cancer, it was not an identity we wanted. It was not a very desirable identity, but it was an identity. It was who she was at that point in time. And if we deny that those two things both always exist and we don't look at the way they play off against each other and we try to say this is an illness and that's an identity, we really narrow our experience of the world. There's so many directions to go. One of the things, uh, since we're on this idea of illness or identity, cure and acceptance is another one of your great... Um, sort of, uh, you know, bifurcations. Uh, this idea that, and again, I think this happens early in the book, you talk about people who accept whatever condition they have as irreversible, they are happier than people who find out or realize that their condition might be reversible. Are you suggesting that people should just accept as, you know, whatever whatever comes, when, however the baby is born, we should we should go with that because you'll be happier if you just accept your lot in life or, or not. The thing that's really bad is when you have a condition which is irreversible and you spend all your time and energy trying to reverse it. Uh, if you have a condition which actually can be cured, it's worth considering curing it. If you have a condition that can't be cured, it's really worth trying to accept it. The problem is that many, many, many conditions fall somewhere in the middle. They can sometimes be cured, they can be partially cured, they can be cured but the cure is incredibly traumatic, and trying to decide which of those to cure and which of them to accept is the real, the real challenge. And who decides that? One of the interesting issues, I think, is raised between parent and child is, do parents make that decision for the child, since you've already established in this interview and in the book that, that parents make decisions that help them maybe more than they help the kids? Or do you wait until the kids come to a certain age and they can make that decision themselves? Is that a proper way to go? The problem is that a lot of the time, by the time the kids have reached a certain age, it's sort of too late to make a lot of these decisions. Right. So for a cochlear implant, they work better if you have them early on. Your ah. brain organizes around input. If there's no sound input, your brain doesn't organize to recognize it. But also, if you wait till you're 20, by the time you're 20, you've been a deaf person for 20 years, and it's become your identity. And at that point, to choose a cure is to reject all of who you are and all of the experience you've had. So with a lot of this stuff, you really have to make up your mind early. The parents have to make up their minds early what path they're going to set their child on. Are they going to push their child down the cure path or toward the acceptance path? And it's a very tough call. Yes. And that's, I think, ultimately, unless, unless I misread the book, I don't think you you make a decision one way or the other. I think you call for, um, you have a number of very poetic phrases, I think, that really kind of, you know, summarize this, I, I, an echosphere of kindness, I think is something you use, that the idea is that we should accept, be more accepting in, in all forms. But you actually, I, I never got the sense that you decided on one side or the other in terms of how this group should, 
you know, behave, you know, good or ill, cure or acceptance, uh, you know, illness or identity. Is that correct, or did you come down pretty hard one way or the other at various times? No, I actually came down very hard on the idea that what you decide now might be different from what you'll decide five years from now, and what you'll decide might be different from what I'll decide, and the point of the book is to allow people to be incredibly well-informed in making their own decisions, very, rather than yeah. to tell them what to decide. Very good. Um, there is an issue, again, in this book you talk about um, some people in the, in the, and again, for want of a better word, and supply it if you can, but for in a disabled community who actually are angered by the efforts at normal or average people trying to change people in their communities to be more like them, that there is an, a, a kind of an outrage. Who are you to decide for us what is a better life and what isn't? Uh, are, are, did you find yourself becoming more sympathetic to that position, or are you also sort of struck, well, why wouldn't you not want to have, you know, uh, one of these conditions? At its most extreme, I think the idea was put forward by uh, someone with autism, Jim Sinclair, who said, um, addressing parents, he said, this is what we hear when you pray for a cure for us, that someday we will disappear and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. He had yes. the sense that the autism is so fundamental to who he is, um, it's so fundamental to who all autistic people are, that when you pray for a cure, you're really praying to have a different child instead of the one you have. Now, it's a very extreme standpoint. I don't yeah. entirely agree with it, either vis-a-vis -vis autism or vis-a-vis -vis anything else, but I think it poses a significant challenge to the opposite obvious assumption, which is, let's make them all just like us. You know, yeah. Making the whole world standardized is a dangerous direction to go in.